Hey guys, just want to let you know now, starting to get some dates on the books. Uh, September 16th through 18th, I'll be at the Phoenix House of Comedy. This is a makeup show from, uh, from before the virus. And uh, go to ryansickler.com for all my live dates. You'll start to see them there. Uh, also want to let you know, this is something people have been asking for years. People have been saying, you got to make a ringtone of your laugh. I don't know why anybody would want that. I can't understand why anybody would want to hear that on their phone. But after years of messages, comments, I did it. We got ringtones of my laugh coming. I promise you we'll put a promo out and blast it out so you know where to get them. But uh, I heard yous, and you're about to hear me on your phone all the time. All right? This episode of The Honeydew is brought to you by Upstart, Raycon, and Coors Pure. More on that later. Let's get into the do. The Honeydew with Ryan Sickler. Welcome back to The Honeydew, y'all. We're over here doing it in the Night Pants Studios. I'm Ryan Sickler, ryansickler.com. Ryan Sickle on all your social medias. Subscribe to the YouTube page. I got to tell you that we're coming up on 100,000 if we're not there yet. Like I said, I'm so grateful and thankful. In one year, we've hit 100,000 subscribers. And um, like I said, I don't don't know if that's good or not. I don't really give a shit. That's what we're doing. I'm keeping my head down, focusing with you all, and we're going to hit those numbers. All right? I'm not looking left or right anymore. I'm looking straight ahead at y'all. All All right? Speaking of y'all... If you love the honeydew and you got to have more, subscribe to my Patreon, the honeydew with y'all. It's only five bucks a month. If you sign up for a year, you get over a month free. Uh, And we are now including video of the honeydew a day early, ad free at no additional cost for the rest of 2021. All right. So you get the entire back catalog plus um, honeydew a day early, ad free, all for five bucks a month. Again, if you sign up for a year, it's a month free. All right. Um, and that community continues to grow and just blow me away with the stories. It's, it's, I love my motherfucking job, y'all. I love my motherfucking job. All right. You know, I record here at the Santa Monica Music Center. Uh, very excited about working with Outreach Through the Arts, helping these kids out, podcasting, teaching them uh, some useful tools moving forward. All right. Um, so when that's out, I'll be promoting it, but I wanted to just get the awareness out. You know, I like to talk about it and help these kids. They're working with the Santa Monica Police Department. Um, so we're going to get a lot of dialogue going and some interesting stuff's going to come out of that. Now, you know what we do here? We highlight the low lights. These are the stories behind the storytellers. And Night Pants Nation, I am very excited to bring back here, second time on The Do, y'all. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back. Jesse Bay Peluso, everybody. Welcome back, girl. Hey! Doing it on the do. You had such a great episode on the first one here. We went deep. By the way, cheers. First first beer ever on the do. Yes. That's some Coors Pure. Organic. You know times have changed when a beer like Coors has gone organic. It's legit. And it's good. It is really good. 92 calories, no sugar. It does contain alcohol. It is delicious. Organic. We're day drinking. Can we say that? Yeah, we can. Are we going to get canceled? No. No, we're going to get sponsored by Coors Pure. <laughs> it is. It's super delicious. I asked you, I'm like, I need a, I need a beer. You got a beer? Yeah. There That's the kind are. of year it's been. Um, will you please, before we get into what we're going to talk about today, plug everything, please. Yes. Um, I am Jesse Mae Peluso. <laughs> That's it. That's oh, all you want. Um, at Jesse Mae Peluso on IG. Jesse May Peluso. YouTube is just youtube.com forward slash Jesse May Peluso. Um, podcast, Sharp Tongue, Sharp Tongue podcast. I have a show coming out on Netflix. I can't say the name, but look out for it in June or July of this summer. Your show? Mm-hmm. Really? Yes. All right. I was one of the very few people who actually got to work a little Good during the you. most tumultuous yeah. year. And also, I partnered with this amazing coffee alternative company called Mudwater, and it's what saved me through the years with just having anxiety and dealing with, as you know, how my life has been for the past three years has been fucking crazy. Um, And I had to stop drinking coffee because it also made me spin out and have anxiety attacks. You really, you nailed it back to that, and that really, and that helped stop it. Once I stopped drinking coffee, I like could sleep at night a little bit. Okay. Um, but Mudwater and I are working together and so we're doing 
I think it's like 15% off their entire purchase. Mudwater.com forward slash Jesse May. Use so, code Jesse May Mud. Mud. What about them? What have they done? Taking the ingredient out? The, like the, Some of the marijuanas these days, they're taking the um, ingredient out that, <laughs> that makes you panic. Are you sounded t- just like a dad. Some of the marijuanas <laughs> these days? Yes, dad. <laughs> Zaddy. I call you Zaddy. You're a total Zaddy. I love that you do. It's my favorite. <laughs> Set a marijuana cigarette. Kids better not be having any of those goddamn marijuana cigarettes. Are you on the jazz cabbage? <laughs> God damn it, Joshua. I've never heard jazz cabbage. <laughs> my friend Chris ever. calls it jazz I've cabbage, never. and I can't not call it that. <laughs> That's a brand new one. I've heard all the devil's lettuce and all devil's that lettuce, shit, but I've never cabbage. heard jazz cabbage. It's the greatest. Um, no, it's not. It's a coffee alternative, but they have mushrooms in it, but not the kind that I add to it, like the fun kind. No, not the kind you add. It's like, you know, healthy adaptogens, like reishi, chaga, ashwagandha. And then I put the fun Bless mushrooms. You. I don't even know what the fuck. <laughs> I don't even know what the fuck this is. <laughs> By the way, Ryan and I, just to be clear, have been talking for three hours. <laughs> Already. And then he's like, we should probably start recording. No, I, I just love you because we had this moment right when you got out of the car. I haven't seen you since oh we my recorded God. here last. And you parked out front of the studio. And I have to say, I'm feeling really cute today. Yeah, you shaved. look cute. You always look shaved. <laughs> but the thing that you said, what is it? Vaxxed and waxed. Yeah. Ready to party. <laughs> Let's I'm vaxxed get and waxed yeah. and ready to party. <laughs> I'm walking over across the street. And uh, there's this old lady behind behind you, old. I saw her. I was and like, good for you. she was banged up, yeah, and she was walking up the street, <laughs> and I just saw you coming out of the car, and you looked cute and everything, and I said, what's up, girl? And you were like, hey. And I, I was, was like, like, hey, Zaddy. <laughs> How you doing? It's not free if you're asking. You got to pay for all this. You're like, oh, no, I was... I was like, sorry, I was talking to her behind you. What's up, Jesse? <laughs> like, it was not like I see you every 10 minutes. And, and then you, you told me to not step in dog poop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you look back, that old lady was looking at us <laughs> like she was my girl. She really did think I yelled at her. My favorite, like, though, is when how you went, what's up, Jesse, mate? Like, <laughs> like, you were bothered by my presence. <laughs> oh, you're here. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I guess I'm going to got a, another coffee mug we got to give away. <laughs> Do I get to keep this one? Yeah, everybody. Now I have a a pair. Mug, yeah. Now you're in my house. I love it. In my heart. I love it. You are for sure. (laughs) Um, look, we had such a great episode last time, and did not get to talk about. I mean, obviously, there's so much more to talk about, but I do want to talk about your dad this time. Can we talk about your dad? We can totally talk about my dad. And I know you're at a point where you're comfortable at least talking about it, but also you're. So involved in in the cause and things like I want you to educate not only me but some of us about what goes on. Yeah, for sure. I my you know, Alzheimer's is a brutal disease. My dad actually, we think it's it's a hard disease to diagnose because it's in that sort of wheelhouse of Parkinson's and any sort of neurodegenerative disease that sometimes shows up as one thing and it's actually something else. But So not to put you on the spot, or I just want to know, maybe you do, maybe you don't. What is the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Well, dementia or is... Or is it part of... It's well, dementia is more of like an umbrella term okay. because there's a lot of there's a lot of different types of dementia. There's like Lou Body, which was what brought, uh, Robin Williams had. Mm-hmm. There's uh, vascular dementia, which is technically what my father was diagnosed with, which, okay. what we think he had because of his symptoms. And Alzheimer's is the leading cause. Alzheimer's is the one that is, you know, the the most um, uh, brutal and abrasive, and the one that takes the most lives. Um, and it's it's crazy because you know, it's a sort of thing where. The symptoms reveal themselves so sneakily because in this society, we where I'm going to start getting in my head every symptom you <laughs> say. Know. I'm like, I had that last week. <laughs> well, everyone I had has that, that thing. Is like... She's over here saying Alzheimer's <laughs> is the Michael Jordan of dementia, for Christ's sake. I mean, that's not the one I want, man. <laughs> no, you know what I mean? Give me the white guy off the bench kind of dementia, something I can deal with. <laughs> like a basic bitch. Can I get the starter kit? <laughs> Let me get the starter kit, Dementia. Do you just want to forget your keys, or do you want to forget your keys, your wife, and where you live? Because we can give you that introduction, that package. But if you also want to not know who you are and where you are, that's going to be extra. At all times. Oh, my. At all times. Oh, my God. Can I 
I take that uh, yeah. and turn it into a joke. <laughs> take that. And put it in my Alzheimer's <laughs> chunk. It's yours in my Alzheimer's chunk. Yeah. <laughs> Ash is losing it. <laughs> See, there's so much misconception around the disease. You know, Alzheimer's, it's Alzheimer's, um, which ALZ, is ALZ, Alzheimer's. Uh, named after the doctor who discovered it. Um, Dr. Terrence Johnston. <laughs> John Smith. <laughs> People have never <laughs> been known to call it old timers. Yeah, I hear that a lot. Well, that's, Or all timers also, all-timers. I hear that as well. There's yep. so many wrong ways of saying it. But old timers comes from, obviously, it being a phonetic symbol or f- sounding phonetically similar but people in our society uh, equate old age with dementia and that is not a normal part of the aging process so calling it old timers like yeah you know everyone does that like oh grandma she's getting forgetful she's got old timers Th- it, that's not that's not how we should age right. it's a disease it's an inflammation of the brain and it is not a normal part of the aging process. Like, that's okay. the most important thing for people to take away that... Just because you get old doesn't mean you lose your memory. No. That's not normal. No, it's not normal. It's 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 purely... It's it's directly uh, connected to a disease, and it is a disease. It's really interesting and important to know because it's not like it's your hearing. No. This is your mind. This is your mind, yeah. and the mind is a very interesting organ. It's one of the only organs that we can only look at posthumously. It's not something we can really study the way we can study other parts of our body That's without right. really injuring us. I got to tell you this. Um, when we were I, – I just had graduated high school, and uh, my really good friend is like – Recently? Brother to me. Yeah. Yikes. I listen. <laughs> Get, I got it done, all right? You know what I mean? 2020 was rough on everybody. You didn't get a GED, got, got, got a GOD. Got, I went back and got my GOD. God. <laughs> this guy's still in high school. <laughs> You're just in there. That's where night pants came from. You're like, oh, I got to get my GED. Night I'm wearing these night, night pants. <laughs> Come on. Um. So, yeah, I, I just graduated college, and my, my friend, who's like a brother, still family to me, and, and his little sister was killed in a car accident, and we're all there in the hospital. And uh, I'm talking to the doctor, and we're talking about the soul. And, and I'll never forget this guy saying this because every he said, "I said, where do you, what do you, do you believe in the soul?" And he's like, "Yeah, I absolutely do." I go, "Where do you think it is in the body?" And he's like, "I think it's in the mind." I go, "Now, why do you say that?" And he goes, "I'll tell you. I can change your fucking kidneys. I can change your heart. I can change all these things. I can give you a new knee, a new shoulder, da, 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 all these things about you, and you're still you." But the moment we just little a flick of the brain can change everything about who you are, and he's like, "That's why I believe the brain is in the or the soul is in the brain." I was like, "Dude, I, that's fantastic." I believe that too. I mean, if you look at the brain, if you look at how the brain works and like the synapses and the firing between the synapses, it's literally it looks like the universe, and it's it's much like the universe in that it's encas- encapsulated in darkness. And we don't really understand it, mm-hmm. yet it's all encompassing, and it's where we come from. And so it's just this interesting comparative between like what the universe is like and what our brain is like. I I, I believe that that's a really astute way of looking at the soul. I never thought about the soul being in the brain. That's very interesting. And you know, isn't I, it? I thought I just was like, yeah, you're right. Because any any alt any alt even. I had another friend whose father uh, passed a brain cancer, and, and the one doctor said, "Look, anytime you have to open the head, just opening it is your, you know, there's airborne shit that could get in there and cause infections, and you got to open it again. And opening the head is never good once. No. You know, it's not great. So the brain is. I didn't realize this because I I went to see a psychiatrist. I had him on my podcast because I've been following brain health and reading mm-hmm. about brain health ever since my father was diagnosed." And this doctor, Daniel Amen, who is a psychiatrist, and he's been doing these spec scans of the brain. It's single photon emitted computer tomography. And it takes a scan of your brain and just looks at the tomography of your brain and sees where there might be injury. And he, he told me an astounding and astonishing statistic, in fact, that he says that 80% of mental health issues like mental illness is due to directly due to an injury a physical injury on the brain which means a lot of these people who are walking around with i mean depression being 
a blanket term, but, you know, um, psychosis and schizophrenia and all these other sort of terms within psychiatry that are affecting so many people, some of it is caused from a physical injury to your brain. Mm -hmm. And then he told me that the brain's consist consistency is like butter. And so when you think about that and you think about the damage that people do to their brain on a daily basis, whether it's you know, um, vices or alcohol or drugs, and then add in TBIs and CTEs, like actual physical yeah. injury to the brain, it's not really built in a way to be treated like that. So, you know, it's just, there's this one time my dad's trajectory of him being sick, we were talking about the soul being in the brain, and it made me think of this. It was, and I'll talk about like sort of the progression of the disease and how hard it is. It's it's like I do want my first question is what's who and what was the first thing noticed? But but tell yes, me yes, I will get I will do tell that. Tell me um what you were just about to say about the soul. Your dad well, wanted you to do this in in the process of him being sick. There was this one moment where he just was so restless, sat down, and he he just didn't want to sit down. Then he wanted to get up, and then he's like, I got to sit down. And he was going through this just cyclical anxiety induced moment and he just couldn't find calm anywhere and and he's standing there and I was like dad just what what do you need how can i help and he said something to me in in hindsight that is so difficult to for the disease is difficult to equate because it exists within the mind so when somebody is sick with this disease, how can they verbalize what's going on? And this was that instance where my father said, I, I, I just can't calm the chaos in my mind. I, I don't know what's happening and my mind, I'm losing my mind. And that was the last time that my dad was able to quantify what he was feeling. And then it just sort of took over. But to answer your question, that's the hardest thing to decipher to track back with this disease because it is such a slow fucking burn and it's the sort of thing where in hindsight it all makes sense all the things that you threw away and just chopped up to old timers or just being dad do you know how many times as a family we say oh that's just dad just dad you know, this disease, it manifests later in life, but it starts early. How early? It's it, as early as your 30s. And th this is not Listen, me saying- I've got crazy brain fog <laughs> right now. I'm not even joking. From this virus, they oh, say yeah. brain fog's real. Well, it's like, I don't remember. Like, my short-term memory has been fucked by this thing. Uh, and then I started thinking this shit. Like, you get, I don't want to freak I'm everybody 48, out. 48, <laughs> but like, why am I putting peanut butter in the fridge? Well, because you want a hard nut. <laughs> and I That's like that way flavor. Better. That's yeah, way you want better. a little hard nut. You want to put your apple slice and put a little hard nut on it. I'm here for that snack. This, forgetting that now all of a sudden. Well, that's different. See, that's the manifestation. That's the symptoms. I'm talking about the implementation of lifestyle, external factors, environmental factors, certain things within your genealogy and your familial influence on your body and your soul and everything being able to contract this disease starts early. And that's a, another misconception that people need to realize. This is, I truly believe through our medical, uh, the advancements in medical technology that we're going to be able to pinpoint this disease a little bit more because it's like the number five killer of is people in our country. High? Yeah, I didn't know it's that high. Yeah, it is. Top five. It's like it, it's like in our our top three have to do with you know heart disease and things like that because we're all completely out of shape yeah. and eat like trash. But Alzheimer's and, and dementia is like number six, five or six of of all time of killers of all killers in in our country. So that's a huge that's a huge number in the top five. Um, so wait, you're telling me if we just have better diets, we could this could reach number one? No. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta do better. Come on, y'all. <laughs> we need to get to number one. Feed your kid cheeseburgers and scream at we, him. Nobody gives a shit. There's not enough charities for five and six. We gotta get up there, guys. Well, Come on. There's man. truth to that shit. Mm -hmm. I mean, we that's a whole other podcast about the business of illness. I know the business of illness. Yeah, it's it's. 
that that part is is alarming. But like through conversations like this, we can sort of break stigmas. And the other stigma is that this is just something that old people deal with. Well, old people deal with it because it happened. It's been happening. It's been happening. They're dealing with the the re, the what then the repercussions the repercussions of the shit that's been going on for decades. Yes, the way they lived, the food, um, the stress wow. level. There's so many things that go into it. From the things that I've studied and, and have read and have found, a lot of it is diet. So much of our food causes internal inflammation and a lot of oxidative stress in our body. And I'm not a doctor. I'm saying a lot of big words, most of the words I understand. But I've read a lot and have tried to educate myself because then I was scared like, oh, fuck. Am I going to forget too? Because my dad did. Right, yeah. Like I got his – Chimples and his hemorrhoids. Am I going to get his fucking Alzheimer's? And his hemorrhoids. <laughs> Are we going three for three, bro? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, you talk about traits. <laughs> my mom gave me like long legs, nice hair, good smile. My dad's like hemorrhoids, pimples, and acne and he- Alzheimer's. Good luck. But bye. don't worry, you're going to forget about it all in your 70s. <laughs> There might be something to it. You know? I mean, everyone's like, oh, I don't want to forget. Really? Have you seen the past year? Yeah, there's, there's a, a couple different. dicks I'd really like to forget. Yeah. I want like selective Alzheimer's for the dicks I've let in my body. <laughs> just turn it on for that dick. I just like, I'm not totally against Alzheimer's if I for- can forget all those selective dicks. Selective Alzheimer's. Yeah, that like, would be really, really would nice. Be, yeah. So I'm going to change my campaign. Get Alzheimer's. You get 12 Alzheimer's, uh, get out of jails. All right, I'm going to take that on Jason's dick. Give me one on Jason's <laughs> dick. All right, I don't remember that dick. All right, okay. You just get chips. Yeah. <laughs> but Remember me? I don't even know who the fuck you are. <laughs> no, sir. I don't, and I don't remember me. So therefore, your dick was never inside of me. Bye. Key things, bye. Um, one of the first things we recognized, I wasn't there. And how old was your dad at the time? This was 2017, September 28th, 2017, I believe. Uh, Actually, no, September 30th. It was on his birthday. I was doing a weekend in Sacramento at, what is that club there? Is it a Punchline. Punchline. And I actually, it was a weekend where I was, the first weekend I was spending with my new man. And I was like all excited. You know, I'm going to go do the road and you can see my life. And we're going to hang out and have some hotel sex and all this stuff. And I'm going to try not to get pregnant. <laughs> try not to. <laughs> oh, my God. It's so hard. I'm allergic to condoms. And I just don't like them. They smell weird. It's like I feel like I. They do smell weird. Yeah. I feel like I work in a factory that makes gloves after I have sex with condoms. Hey, guys, I'm safe. I swear. Um, no, it's just the latex <laughs> from my pussy. It's fine. We're good. Who did you who did you yell at? <laughs> Who's over and there? Anyone listening? <laughs> anyone out there listening? <laughs> Do you laugh this much with everybody? I feel like half of our podcast last time was just us wheezing. So I'm like telling this like one of the worst. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Like literally the worst moment of my life. So I can't. Uh, literally, like if I think on my deathbed, what was the worst moment of your life? It's not this, but it's, it's it was what I'm about to tell you. <laughs> but this is this is why this podcasts are important. Podcasts are important. Oh Jesus Christ. So I'm sitting on the stairwell. Uh, my mom sent me a text message that said, something's wrong with your dad. So they were still together? Your no. Parents? My no. parents have been separated since I was about nine. Okay. And my mom remained really close. They're both really close until they both died. <laughs> oh, my God. I know. Your mom. I'm so sorry. Your mom. <laughs> you're just over there laughing. <laughs> they were close until they both died. Yeah, I think they were close until one of them died. Yeah, they you were close until one of them died. <laughs> when they both died, they got closer again. Yeah, now they're, they're, they're as close <laughs> they're as they back. can be. We're back. We're back, <laughs> motherfucker. Um, You're orphaned, you said. That's what you said I'm to orphaned. me outside. Yeah, I'm orphaned now, which is the most humbling experience ever. Um, But that'll be, I guess, that'll be our third installment. <laughs> 
<laughs> of our podcast back. trilogy. You're back. <laughs> yeah, my mom just said there's something wrong with your father. And she went over to take him out for his birthday. I guess they couldn't get a hold of him. He wasn't answering his phone. And she pulled up and his the trunk of his car was open. And he wasn't down there. And the door was locked. And she went upstairs. He let her in. And he was trying to call someone back on his remote. And so she just was like, this is not old timers. <laughs> this isn't normal. Right. And that was in September of... 2017. So September 30th. It yeah, was be- on his birthday. What birthday? September 30th. No, but how old? He was 81. 81. Yeah. Okay. And I was supposed to be born on his birthday, but I actually, they had me come out two weeks early. And my other sister was born on his birthday. For real? Yeah. Isn't that wild? Wow, it's that a very is. wild, uh, you know, un- that would unusual. Be crazy if people, had, yeah. Your two so daughters? You're, you're, you're both your daughters, yeah. But your dad and your sister celebrate a birthday together? They do. That's got to be bittersweet. Too. I'm sure it is. Um, and and so from that point, that was the first tangible thing. But there was something earlier in the summer that now we know what it was. He was having equilibrium issues and said he felt dizzy and he couldn't quite, you know, his surroundings were a little off to him. And so we just thought it was just... We didn't know what it was. And honestly, I hate to say this out loud, but I think it needs to be said. Our our medical and hospital businesses, I hate to say businesses, our, our healthcare system sucks and it, sucks. it failed my family. And it's not their fault. It's not one person's fault. Sure. It's an accumulative Years of fucked upness yes. going on throughout. That's some, one of the most frustrating factors of this is just, you know, there's not enough information or there's not enough drive to get the information. I don't know. I don't know what the fucking solution is, but there were so many areas and maybe maybe it's me just trying to hang on and have that sort of grief moment where you want to blame somebody and be able to put it to something. But I also know other people have gone through this a similar scenario where they felt that they didn't get care and hands-on care and somebody who actually was like, hmm, you know, let me think outside the box a little bit instead of referencing some book from 1995 that is completely out of date, you know? So early on in the summer with the equilibrium issues, we brought him to a neurologist and she, you know, my father up to that point had been a very functional alcoholic drinking you know, he, he used to count his drinks. <laughs> oh, really? My dad would count his drinks. He had vodka soda and lime. And he would use the same glass and have the bartender just freshen up the lime. And he would count the limes by the end of the night to know when it was time to stop. I mean, he would stop at like eight or nine. Obviously, <laughs> <laughs> the system didn't really work. I think it's just when the cup got filled with the limes, he's like, I'm good. Yeah. But, and he was never, he was a fun drunk. It was never a drinking where we were like, oh, we got to talk to dad. We just accepted it. And he never called us in the middle of the night crying about Vietnam. <laughs> That's a hell Do you know people have those dads? <laughs> There's definitely some people that have had those dads. You're like, God damn He never it, screamed, dad. your mother's a fucking whore. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> he never raised his hand to us. He just wanted to hit on women and laugh and tell jokes. And he was the most jovial. And drink Coors Pure light beer. Coors Pure. Organic. Organic. But better, chill about Better it. for you. <laughs> <laughs> he never raised his hand. He was just a very affable man. And um, so when we brought him Did to this. Did he ever remarry? No. No. He's a difficult. Did he date, though? He or? tried. He, he, he dated. I really was. This one woman, um, I can't remember her name, but she was a lawyer, and she had a son, and they were together for a while. And I was like, really? This I was about 16. I was like, oh, this could be something good for him. But he had so many, you know, that generation didn't come from 
a place, a safe place for them to be able to deal with the demons that their parents had instilled on them. Sure. You know, we're talking like turn of the century yeah, shit. Yeah, we're the first real, I feel like we're the first generation of people like, all right, let's get our shit together. Let's here. talk. Yeah, let's communicate. Let's talk about it. Let's normalize Let's unpack it. our yes. shit. Let's normalize yes. unpacking our shit. This generation, they shoved it, put it in a suitcase, taped it, glued it shut, and put it in the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. And was like, go out and have another it family. It happen. <laughs> yeah. And now it's gone. Yeah. His generation treated emotions the way the mafia treated people who yeah. turned <laughs> against them. <laughs> they, they treated off them. <laughs> <laughs> they put that shit in the yeah, damn bury Brooklyn them and Bridge. Don't even look for it. You're never look, gonna find them. Don't those, you those cry, see it, dear? <laughs> I'm going to put a cement block around your goddamn ankle, okay? Don't you fucking cross me. <laughs> so he's, you know, he he just was a, a very affable human being. And the alcoholism, although we were like, well, it's probably too much. It wasn't enough for us to be like, let's have a conversation intervention. You can't do that with someone in their 70s. You have an intervention with someone in their 70s. It's not going to fucking work. No, they're gonna be like, you all want to talk? Hang on, let me get a vodka soda real quick. <laughs> That's actually what we want to talk to you That's about. That's totally. <laughs> Let me get two then. <laughs> you say we're going to be a while? <laughs> Can I get some chicken wings? <laughs> yeah. I like them naked. <laughs> he, um, so when we brought him to this neurologist, she chopped up his vertigo to drinking. She said, well, you know, you do. It does look like you drink a little too much. And why don't we why don't we cut that out? And she's like, but it's very important that you go slow, cutting it out because your body has become dependent upon it. Your brain, your chemistry is altered to be able to facilitate the alcohol so you can function on a daily basis. So your entire brain chemistry evolves around the way you drink and how you consume alcohol. And it's very, very, very important for people who are alcoholics or whatever type of addict. You got to go slow when you come off of it. You can't go cold turkey. And especially, this was something, another revelation and another thing that we found out, certain cer certain brain diseases, and like I said before, like neurodegenerative things, can be exacerbated through the immediate pulling away of, I see. A, of a vice, like drinking. So can I ask you this? Maybe you know this one as well. My same friend of mine, his mom, who who lost his sister, she's like a mom growing up to me still. But um, both of her parents, um, within a year of each other, both got it. Her dad got it first. Um, and then they had to take away. Like one night he just showed up in the garage with his shotgun. And there was, oh thank God. Gosh. But the doctor's like, yep, you what better the take say? all the shotguns, take every, because he's a hunter. Like put it all oh away. Like, and she's like, I didn't even think of, like he knows where that is. I don't, because she had to move in to take care of him. She's like, I don't know where the fuck his guns are. Um, and then um, his wife got it a year later, like after his passing. And one of the things the doctor said was to take away artificial sweeteners. And she said that she really noticed the difference in clarity in her parents when they didn't have drinks that had artificial sweeteners. And I was just curious because you said diet. You brought up a lot of these things. Do you know about any of that sort of stuff? Sugar is pure poison sugar, for your brain. Even regular any sugar kind. too. Okay. It, it's pure poison. It it's it it affects so much. You know, it's, it's just honestly – when I think back to, you know, the development of the disease within my father, he had an enormous sweet tooth. He did. Yeah. He, are you kidding me? But all that alcohol turns into sugar, it too, sure at does. the end of the day. It, it's, and that's what I'm saying. Like, it's such a, like, an amalgamation of so many things. It's your diet. It's your lifestyle. And a big part of that is community and, you know, being able to be social. We're social creatures. Right. And that's a huge – when you think about us just being in quarantine – I don't know about you, but I came out of quarantine not really being able to have a conversation or speak in full sentences because I was out of practice because I just was hanging out with, you know, toddlers and dogs. <laughs> and yeah. when, you know, you meet people and you have a mask on, it's so when you, you start to degenerate a little bit just on the basis of being in quarantine and not being in a community and talking. And imagine what, what happens to somebody who's already sort of predispositioned to develop a disease like Alzheimer's or something like Parkinson's. So there's so many factors that if you restrict them from your life can sort of become the thing that, that makes it you more susceptible to developing that. 
But um, yeah, she chopped it up to him needing to stop drinking. And, and because my father was the way he was, a little stubborn, doesn't really listen to the details, doesn't follow orders, he stopped drinking abruptly. And that was in oh, he August. Did. Okay. He stopped drinking abruptly in August. He didn't go slow. And by September, whatever disease had been, like I said before, building through decades had just bloomed. Really? Within a month. Do you think him going cold turkey like that helped accelerate that? A hundred percent. You do. Yes, and and that's something that it's and and in the same breath, the alcoholism sort of subdued the symptoms. Oh, I see. So it it becomes what's you know it's just dad versus something's Dad's a wrong. A little bit buzzed versus yes. something's wrong. I see. Okay, yes. all right. Because he's always that. been a little like he'd call me. And I actually have this plaque in my house right now where he wrote me a note and it says, La, um, hey, Chris, Care, M, Nancy, Jess. He used to call me and go through the names of every woman mm-hmm. he ever met or knew oh, yeah. and then finally land on mine. Yeah. I'm like, well, what is it? What, what is this bingo? What is happening? <laughs> Like fish and pole, cutlass supreme. My uh, grandma used to do it. I'm like, the, you just threw the dog in. Like nobody's pepper. You don't have any relative named Pepper. Okay, that's the dog, grandma. Who's Cracker? <laughs> Who the hell is Cracker? And so that sort of him, you know, the disease had already sort of manifest and show itself by August because he was sort of having this equilibrium issue, and then the abrupt, you know halt of drinking just it was a perfect storm for the disease to be like hey it was like beyonce getting rid of the two others <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah there goes destiny <laughs> oh it's just beyonce now bitch i am here and i need diet coke on my rider and so his his disease his disease had a time to shine and you know my mom going over in september was when we really realized something was wrong because he had sort of incubated himself. He he um, pulled away. He withdrew from hanging out at the bar. And ironically, because he was at this drinking hole all the time, the change of pace in Syracuse, being there sort of gave him purpose. He had community. He had friends. He'd right. play bar kino. He hung out. They knew his drink. Um, it was his his, his space. So there's so many things when I look backwards, I get so frustrated because in my mind, I always think like, what What if he just kept drinking? What if he stayed the happy drunk he was? Do you think he would be here still? I don't know. And that's why like when you ask those questions, you can't really harp on them too long because the what ifs and the hypotheticals drive you crazy. But it's definitely something that I've asked to myself and to the universe and maybe so. You know, but it just was the perfect storm for him to quit drinking. And then that thing that sort of gave him purpose gave his disease a stage and then he withdrew. And so when he withdrew, he stayed at his apartment. He wasn't washing. He wasn't quite finding the bathroom the way he should. Mm -hmm. And by the time my mom went over on that day with his trunk open and going upstairs, it was a different person. He had a beard. My father never fucking had a beard. Are you kidding me? An Italian an upstate Italian man with a couple wives and a bunch of daughters <laughs> and like 45 used cars. That man doesn't have a beard. He dresses nice, nice and shaves every day. And so he just, it was like, you know, a surprise party. It was a really shitty surprise party that we had where Alzheimer's so, just showed up or, or vascular dementia. Here's the thing we talk about. We we always talk about how we feel about this and our process of what we went through and we mm-hmm. went through. And you know, dying is a very lonely uh, thing. You're you're going out on your own. We we lose this one person. They lose everybody. Mm-hmm. Your dad loses all the cars and all the all the daughters. <laughs> the and golf the, clubs. The clubs. The ex wives. All he the vodka lo- sodas. He loses all the sodas. All of them. Um. So there's two things I want to talk about, and one is his point of view first because mm-hmm. I've mentioned this show before but you you may have seen it. if you haven't you should watch it um, but it's called You Don't Know Jack oh. HBO did this documentary about Jack Kevorkian okay. 
Wow. Um, and Pacino plays him. And they intercut it with real footage of Kevorkian and like the sort of this documentary style. Yes, I did it's see that. I'm gonna have awesome. to rewatch it. It's so good. Yeah, it was. I remember it being fascinating. And I remember the. So what they did was they used interviews of the real people he would talk to mm-hmm. in within the documentary, and um, he didn't charge. Um, he he just asked you pay for his airline ticket, and he would come out, and he said you better be ready to go. Like make your peace wow. with each other. Um, and he would show you how it would go. He'd put a needle in you, and the body would sort of rise, and it would exhale, and they're gone. They're gone peacefully, not ugly. There's no vulgar shaking and vomit and spit, nothing. It's peaceful. Um, but there was one point where this it always stuck out to me. This one lady, she said um, she stood in her backyard, and for 30 minutes, she didn't know where she was. And then, and then it clicked. Ugh. And she said to her husband, listen, if that happens again— more than twice a week, call him. And she said one day she just was out there for hours, and then it hit. And she's like, "All right, I'm. I don't even. I don't even know my backyard anymore. Like she had lost everything, but had a moment of clarity where she was like, "I'm ready. Like let's do this." And I just wonder, like, what your if you even know, like, what your dad went through. Like, did you have conversations? Were you able to have conversations? Like, do you do you understand what's happening? You're losing your mind. Like, were you was he that? present or did it or this alcohol thing happened so fast you really didn't even get time you know i wasn't expecting you to say it went from a to z within like a month it it, and we weren't either i mean that's why it was diagnosed as vascular dementia usually that's brought on by a stroke so they think maybe somewhere along the line he had a stroke and we don't Mm. know and that's another hard thing to detect um we were there are those like moments of hope like the lucidity. And so there were early on, I remember us having a conversation because we, we had to get home care because we didn't, Mm -hmm. we, we didn't know what, what it was. We didn't know what it was for months. And that's why this disease is so fucking brutal because by the time you have some sort of definitive diagnosis, you're already 20, 30, 40 grand in the hole with home care. Oh, yeah. Your stress, every, we were all stretched so fucking thin. And mind you, I'm on the West Coast. I'm having, I was flying home. To Syracuse? All, every month. Wow. Every time I could, in between shows, layovers, whatever I could do. Um, And my sister dealt with everything. And it, it just was such a, 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 a scramble. And, you know, we're trying like the sort of thing where you, you know, try and do all these bullshit diets. We were doing the same thing for his mind. We're like, well, we'll cut out this. So I'll bring over more blueberries. Like we didn't know what the fuck to do. We were just trying to like, we were literally plugging holes in a ship that was already sunk. And that made it difficult. You know, there's another, there's a couple of things about this disease. It's one of the most expensive diseases to have because of the home care, inevitable home care, inevitable memory right. care no facility. What, it's coming. It, you, it, the amount of money it takes to care for somebody on a 24 hour clock is exorbitant and it's fucking criminal. Personally, and I, I'm not saying people don't deserve I, those those people who take care of home health aides. Oh, yeah. They deserve every damn dollar. But the fact that that's not something that is readily available for people and is something that's covered to me is criminal because this is a disease that society, our food and companies that are making the food Giving is directly yes. affa- affecting. They are a part of the process, but that's another conversation. Um, but it is it was difficult for us. You know, we had to have a conversation with him where we had to be like, we have to put you somewhere and like just. We never thought that would be the thing with him. You know, we were we 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 weren't we we're close. We we loved him. Like we that wasn't something that we wanted to do with either of our right. fucking parents. Yeah. And him being the stubborn Italian, you know, we went to start to go look at places for him to go and I got to tell you fucking walking into one of those places. You're like I can't put him here. It just it it feels like it's like such a um helpless feeling. It feels like you're gripping soap and it's wet and you just you keep gripping and it keeps slipping and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Like that's what what this disease feels like. 
But we did, you know, there were moments of some lucidity, but those, they just, they become shorter, less frequent. But the the irony of that, and, you know, we can go into whatever you want to talk about, is the scarcity made the, made it more special, those lucid moments. Not knowing when they were going to come or what they were going to be or how yeah. long they were going to last made them the most valuable thing in life at that time. But... You know, I remember going home early on and I, <laughs> I had gotten a mattress sent to me from this company. Who well, I won't say because they haven't treated us as nice as Coors. <laughs> Coors Pure. This mattress company had sent me a mattress. And I had it sent to my dad's house because I was like, well, since he's soaked his entire mattress and has peed in every corner maybe we can put a little something nice in the place just for now we were literally doing anything we could to we were doctoring up a so crack you, whore you did leave him there he's still there we think <laughs> <laughs> let's take a quick break and tell you about our first sponsor upstart if you have multiple credit cards you know that tracking multiple balances due dates website logins all that stuff can be stressful Upstart makes things simple with one monthly payment in one place. Upstart is the fast and easy way to get a personal loan to pay off your debt all online. Whether it's paying off credit cards, consolidating high interest debt, or funding personal expenses, over half a million people have used Upstart to get a simple fixed monthly payment. Upstart finds smarter rates with trusted partners because they assess more than just your credit score. With a five-minute online rate check, you can get approved the same day and you can receive your funds as fast as one business day. If debt is taking over your life, it's time to get a fresh start with Upstart. Listen, I know you guys use Upstart. You hit me up about it. You've gotten great rates. You've gotten uh, consolidation, one monthly payment. I wish I had something like Upstart back in the day. Find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash honeydew. That's upstart.com slash honeydew. Don't forget to use my URL to let them know I sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Go to upstart.com slash honeydew. Our next sponsor is Raycon. Whether it's for work or play, a lot of us are going to be on the move again this summer. All right? I'm going traveling. I'm going to Baltimore. I plan on going visiting family. I plan on doing a lot of getting out there now, especially that I'm vaccinated. All right? Uh, and I wear my Raycons everywhere. I just was down in Mexico, took my Raycons. I'm out by the pool with my Raycons in Mexico. Listen to what I want to listen to. They're fantastic. People keep asking me, how do they stay in? They have adjustable earbuds. You put them right in. I'm telling you, Raycons are great. I use them. My stepson took them, won't even give them back. My other pair, I had to get another pair. So whether you're working out, a pair of Raycon wireless earbuds in your ears can make all the difference. You get crisp, powerful beats at half the price of other premium audio brands. Raycons look great. They feel even better. They come in a range of cool colors and with customizable gel tips included for a comfortable in-ear fit. And they have multiple sizes. They will fit your ears for sure. And Raycons are built to go wherever you go. They have quick and seamless Bluetooth tooth pairing, 24-hour battery life, and a compact charging case. I'm telling you, I take them everywhere with me, on walks, to traveling. I give them to the kids in the car. So listen up. Raycon's offering 15% off all their products for my listeners, and here's what you got to do to get it. Go to buyraycon.com slash honeydew. There, you'll get 15% off your entire Raycon order, and it's such a good deal you want to grab a pair and a spare. That's 15% off at buyraycon.com slash honeydew. Buyraycon.com slash honeydew. Our next sponsor is Coors Pure. Do you ever feel the pressure to keep up a healthy life? Like you try to get a workout daily, you eat healthy 100% of the time, you keep up with the wellness trends, you feel like you're trying so hard all the time. And sometimes the simple act of using a standing desk or getting a quick run in is enough to celebrate. Well, let me tell you something. 
Celebrate those everyday triumphs with Coors Pure. I celebrate. I come in here. I sit down. Ash and I record. We do our ads. We do our Patreons. We do the episodes. I go outside. I don't have a ticket. I go home. I have a Coors Pure. It's a $70 ticket here in Santa Monica. It's expensive, and they're cleaning these streets all the time. Doesn't look like it, though. Coors Pure is all about promoting balance and giving aggressive affirmations to everyday heroes. Coors Pure is the perfect beer to celebrate the wins of everyday life. So when you want to enjoy a beer, without the guilt reach for Coors Pure it's organic but chill about it go to CoorsPure.com to see where you can find Coors Pure celebrate responsibly Coors Brewing Company Albany Georgia look you can find them everywhere they're hard to find sometimes in a liquor store because everybody's snatching them up but I found them at Target go get your Coors Pure at Target now let's get back to the do I really <laughs> wanted to ask you because I got to feel like you feel like you're abandoning your own dad. You're leaving him in this building and then off you go. It That's exactly what it feels like. And we. Oh, I'm just trying to put myself in your dad's position of like watching you all leave. Like what? He was like, there's no. The first place we went to, there just was no fucking way. And it was all my sisters and my dad. I, I just I felt his energy. And my out of all my sisters, I was the closest with my father. Him and I had a very, very, very special bond. And he loved all of us equally. Me definitely more. I definitely was a favorite. But <laughs> I even asked him when he was like on his deathbed. I'm like, don't you fucking forget. Don't you go haunting don't me. Don't be telling people you, you forgot you said that. <laughs> you can haunt them. Okay? Write it down. Write it down. <laughs> we went, we shopped around. You know, we, because it was such a, brutal decision and also we didn't know what we were doing or what we were up against still we just knew he needed help we had right, no right. definitive no diagnosis had, yeah. for a month and a half maybe two months he had a home care nurse who would come for a couple hours and then she would say hey this is not a four-hour job because it would progress so fast we literally got you know with alzheimer's you know there being um so many types of dementia alzheimer's being the the, the number one there is just so many other th variables that go along with it, you know, and, and for on average, people suffer with the disease eight to 10 years from from. Oh, wow. I didn't realize it was that long. Eight to 10 years of them being in the symptomatic right, right. era of Even Alzheimer's have, or dementia. They might not realize it till the last year of that. Right. Well, you, you, you probably would know. But what, what I'm saying, like I said before, decades of the disease taking up residency in your body and then manifesting itself. It's such a slow burn. By the time the symptoms really start to get into the later stages, because there's a few stages of it. That's when it snowballs. Yeah, that's when it starts to snowball. But eight to 10 years, our dad had the, the silver lining. The highlight was that we got a crash course. It was a year. A year, which is so unheard of when it comes yeah, to this disease. That's what I'm saying. I didn't expect to hear you say a year. A year. We got 10 years of the illness mm -hmm. in a year. It was it was the cliff notes of it. And, you know, most people would think, oh, man, that's not enough time to say goodbye or to tie your loose ends. I didn't have any of those with him. We we sucked the life out of each other. Not to say I wouldn't want him around now, but I, there's no way I'd be sitting here with you looking as good as I do in these quarantine titties. And you look great. Thank you. If my father was suffering for eight years with this disease right. or still if I'm three years in, I would be, I would be a fucking mess. So that's like the silver lining of this whole scenario. But, you know, leaving him, we, we ended up on a assisted living, which is so hopeful. It, you're basically like something's wrong. He can still handle himself. By the time, you know, we found this really cute place where there's all these, like, we try to sell it to him. Like, Hey, it's like, <laughs> I can't wait to hear this sales. It's pitch. like hedonism, but with bibs and walkers. <laughs> Titties and all still there, just covered up by the bibs. You heard of a moo moo? <laughs> Every, everybody's like already bending over. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> because of osteoporosis. <laughs> Got free Viagra at the commissary. There's no lap dances, <laughs> just laps, because everyone's sitting everyone's down. Everyone's sitting, yeah. Every dance is a lap dance. <laughs> <laughs> oh god! It's it's so we were, I say hopeful <laughs> because, you know, this disease isn't. It's not neat. 
it's not like you can go, okay, by month two, he's going to be in stage two. And this and is the stage. Here's what you need to do, and here's the book for that. And, it's, yeah. it's such, it, that's why it's so expensive and so emotionally taxing because it goes like this. It's like you go back, oh, you get hopeful, and then you're three stages deep, and then you come back a little bit, and you're like, oh, it's getting better, and then he doesn't know who the fuck he is. Did you ever have the conversation with him that you're you're le- you're dying, you're going to die, and did you get to say a goodbye when he was coherent? Like, were you where you actually knew what was happening to him? Yeah, I got to what do that. What was that like? Um, he was in the hospital. Um, nurse. He was in a nursing home. Actually, no, he was in the hospital because I think he had fallen. Oh, no, he threw shit. He threw shit. Actual shit? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he threw shit. It was his shit. He threw it at his roommate, which he probably deserved it. He probably said something rude. (laughs) That's how monkeys used to solve problems, and now my dad does it, and he's an asshole. Come on. Maybe he's just resourceful. Maybe he's just a straightforward Italian. He's like, what'd you say to me? Yeah, I'll tell you what. I'm going to give you a whole slice of this (laughs) bolognese. Yeah. I got a calzone Listen, coming your way. I want my own room. Okay, so I, I appreciate the sacrifice you're about to take. <laughs> yeah, there's corn in it. Yeah, they fed me corn last night, by the way. <laughs> the, the, That's a surefire way to get your own room. Throw Emily shit on me. people. She's like, Dad threw <laughs> shit. I'm like, he threw a fit? She's like, well, yeah, but it was a fit shit filled with fit. shit. shit fit. <laughs> I think that's where a shit fit comes from. <laughs> Throwing a shit fit. Oh, man. And I laughed. And I, I'm such an asshole. I'm like, well, what did his roommate do? <laughs> <laughs> what, what did Harry do? <laughs> Harry didn't do anything. My dad just woke up and didn't know who Harry was and why was he in his room. And so, like, the rainbow trajectory of his assisted living facility placement was we walked into a you know a nursing home we said fuck that we found an assisted living we started to fill out the paperwork for that but by the time the paperwork was filled out and he was accepted he had already advanced too much for them to take him because you have to be somewhat independent to live in assisted living we didn't know that and then we had to find a memory care facility um we found one in syracuse that did you know great work and you know (laughs) that whole process was just like you were talking about like leaving him there i i don't have any kids i don't know what it's like to leave them to go to school it didn't like that it's not like that at all because you're literally walking away f- from them as you knew them and every time you leave yes, them you're leaving a, a piece of them when you come back yep. yeah they're different you yeah. don't even know how different no. and neither do they no so you know that part was really hard. And then so, you know, he went to the memory care facility and then it just progressed so fast. So by the time he was in the, the hospital, we were talking about end of life and hospice and what the next. With him? With his nurses and doctors mm-hmm. and our family, not in front present, of him. Not in front of him. No, okay. it, they did a lot of that. And I had a problem with it. I was it. curious what I'm saying. It's, your, it's his life. Like. I'm over here. I'm the one that you got to come wipe my ass and do all this shit. Like, tell me what the fuck's going on. I had a problem with people talking over my dad. Yeah. Like he was. Around him like he's not even him. there. Yeah, fuck yeah. I get that. And, and you know, oh, he's not processing. He's just, I don't give a fuck. How do you know? Right. How do you know he you won't process? You don't know. Yes, You're not you. in his brain. You don't know what he's retaining. Right. And nobody knows anything about this fucking disease. We can't get a control over it. So don't stand here and tell me that I'm being sensitive for asking you motherfuckers to take the conversation. Ask Harry how sensitive we're being. <laughs> Ask Harry. Good shot, Dad. <laughs> you still got that arm, Dad. <laughs> He's like, I get a vodka soda. I'm like, get him a fucking vodka get soda. Him too. Okay, I. But to your question. Yes, yes. I was fortunate enough to say. The things that people so often don't get the yeah. luxury to say, and it was only it was on the heels of my brother in law who had been through a lot of loss. My brother in law was just so ama- such an amazing human. He saw this coming a mile away. Even though we had all the hope in the world, he he had been around enough death, and he sat us down. And he goes, "You need to have the conversation with your dad, because sometimes the soul hangs on, and you need to let him know that it's okay to go." And a lot of this disease and so much in life is is normalizing and 
improving our relationship with loss and letting go. The more we can let go, the more space we have for love in our own hearts and the more we're able to move through life without regrets and, and holding grudges. And so my brother-in-law Steve said that to me and we were at the hospital having this hospice conversation in one of the rooms and all my sisters were there and I realized that that's a very, you know, it's who knows what everyone's schedule is going to be and how we're going to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. And so we went in with him and he's sitting down and we're just kind of petting him because after having that fucking heavy ass conversation of what to do with your dad as a body. Right. Man, nothing. As a problem. As, as a problem. Yes. As something to handle. As something. This thing we got to take care of. Yeah. yeah. Like, what do we do with his like nuts? I don't know. <laughs> his nuts. <laughs> Is nuts. <laughs> Just trying to lighten it up every so often. You get buried with your nuts, or we take a moment a jar. Do you guys got a special little box for the <laughs> nut cremation? Is there a scrotal urn? There's a business idea. There is a dick and ball fucking <laughs> a cremation. Dick and, dick and ball box. That's my dick and balls. And it's my just dad. An my dad's dick and balls. My daddy's dick, dick and balls. <laughs> That's what you call it. Daddy's dick and balls. <laughs> Zaddy's dick and balls. <laughs> Because I always call you Zaddy. <laughs> oh, shit. So off of just that heavy-ass conversation, I was like, I'm not going to have any other... I'm not going to have any other confidence or motivation or, or ability to say this if I don't say it now. And so we're all just kind of surrounding him, and I said, we're okay. And, and, and he wasn't communicative at mm -hmm. this point. He wasn't able to carry on a conversation. Um, the last thing he laughed at was a fart card. Was it? Because it was his birthday. So this whole thing was so, you know, I told you outside, I believe everything happens for a reason. There were so many dates that things happened and that were instrumental, you know, from the date of him, my mom telling me something was wrong with him to the date of us saying, like verbally letting him know he could go. Um, it was on and his your birthday. your sister's there, which is also her birthday. It's her birthday. Uh. So she she got him the card, and we were trying to talk with him, but it just was impossible. And it was one of those cards where you open it up, and it makes a fart noise. And he could not stop laughing. Oh, that's great. All right. He could not stop laughing. And, and there's a video. You know, I documented this whole thing. There's a video of us singing. I think we were singing Sinatra. He was, and that's the other thing about this disease. Music is so, no pun intended, instrumental. When in my friend's helping. sister was in a coma, not to compare it, but just to be out, they said the same thing like, keep the brain active. Keep you have the brain to keep active. the brain yes, active. That's what they said. And they played, they told us to bring in music and everything. Yeah. It's Music's huge. And I learned that music is one of the only things, especially when you're playing it, it activates all chambers and parts of your brain it's one of the only things that does that and that's why people who get dementia alzheimer's Lou body any of these sort of you know things under the uh, dementia umbrella they will the music that they thrived in usually it's around between 16 and 20 years old that's like your era of music mm -hmm. if you play that music they remember it mm -hmm. and it's it's like a phenomenon that they're able to retain you know certain things that's why they remember things out of the blue and they're able to sing these songs even though they're losing all, all their other faculties. And um, so that day I remember him laughing at that fart card and we were singing Sinatra and uh, that was the only communication we were able to do, song and farts. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's and, what we're, I mean, look, you come in like that and you go out like that. All yes, like and... He wouldn't respond to anything we said. You know, do you know who this is? Do you know who that is? And Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. When's the first time he forgot who you were? I'll tell you that right after I tell you this. That's a great question. Um, he wouldn't respond to any of our, you know, he didn't, it, there's no conversation being had. And, and so we didn't even know if he was going to understand us telling him he could let go. And so... We're there with him, and, and I'm just telling him, I love you. You know, my sister Karen, I was like, Karen is good, and she was saying she's good and she's happy, and I told him I was happy and, and that I was loved, and he is loved, and he is safe. And he fucking started to cry. No. He, 
you could visibly see him register what we said. And like, that's why people who are dealing with this disease, they need to know they are still there. They can hear you. They can feel you. They can smell. They can taste. They can, all their senses are still there. They're just being hijacked by a really cruel, cruel fucking individual. And to not deviate from how you'd normally love them, to think that they can't understand what you're saying. And that, that release, that, that ability to release him changed everything for me as a, as a human. Like to tell the, the one man who didn't try to fuck me how much I love him. <laughs> <laughs> he just was such a, an amazing dad. He was, he wasn't the, the, he didn't have all his shit together and he, he was a fuck up at times. And sometimes, you know, he wasn't so great with money, but he did not, he was not cheap with his love. And he, he always told us he loved us. And man, that's well said. It, it's just, that is well said. It, it's, it's, it's who he was to his core. And to be able to release him from the shackles of that fucking disease, because who knows? Like that doctor, uh, you were talking about the soul being in the mm-hmm. mind. Who knows how much of people who are going through these things, like my father and people who are sick and comas, who knows how much of them are hanging on because. They haven't thought they could let go. Right, I, I'm sitting here just blown away by that. Like, yeah, like almost like God. Thank you, thank you. The burden is off of me now. Right, mm-hmm. and, and think about a parent's love. Think about you wanting to protect your daughter mm-hmm. and fighting tooth and nail to be there for her through the fucking end. That doesn't go anywhere. No, but to hear her let you know that oh. it's it's everything. It's it's it's. It's you paying your love forward. Mm-hmm. You know, if you love something enough, you I have mean, to let it go. It's the most unselfish thing you can do. It's the right most there. unselfish thing you do. Fight, push harder. You can do this. You, no. No. Enough is enough. It's okay to quit. It's okay to stop. It's yes. okay to go. It's like that homie at Love Actually was trying to fuck his best friend's <laughs> wife. You got to f- enough now. He shows up with the poster boards. <laughs> <laughs> that was me. Um, but to be able to do that was like, it wasn't only important. It was like, it was, it, I felt honor in it. Yeah. I felt, I felt pure. It was like the, it was like the crossroads of pure love and pain. And it was the most, probably one of the most defining moments of my life where I, I wasn't, and not that I won't always be his daughter, but I became, I became a woman in that moment. And, you know, you asked me about the first time he forgot who Wait, I was. can I ask you real quick yeah. to that? Mm-hmm. How soon after that did he pass? Within a week. Within a week, I wow. think so. Okay. Less, less than two weeks for sure because he moved to another, he moved to, I think, like a nursing home after that because he was in the hospital. Yeah, he moved to a nursing home and he was gone rather s- soon. Um, the first time he forgot who I was... You know, first let me say marijuana was amazing through this whole process for me. For him or you? <laughs> <laughs> I got him some. For for both of us. Uh it really helped me connect with my anxieties and release them through a of a, a veil of love and not fear. You know, through an mm-hmm. understanding that things happen, things fall as they may, and I can either I have a choice to fight it. Or to learn from it and and to allow it to change me and to know that whatever change I go through, that's going to be something I can use to service other people. And and that's how I approached it just for my own survival, not in any other, you know, conscious effort other than I will fall the fuck apart if I don't turn this into something useful. And so I smoked a lot of weed and there was one day he called me. It was like six o'clock on, um, it was like a weekday. I was walking around my neighborhood in Marina del Rey, California. And I'd have to call him a lot. You know, this is before he got into the hospital and, and nursing home. I had to call him a lot because he fucking forgot. And he called me once and he was talking about relations between everybody because I was mentioning people. And they start to forget the 
the web of connections within a family and who's who. And so I mentioned Emily, my sister, and my mom, Nancy. And he goes, okay, now Emily, all right. Um, now how is she related to you? And I was like, oh, she's my sister. And Nancy now, now how, how do I know her? I was like, well, that's your ex-wife. You've slung the dick a couple times. <laughs> You've been in and out. Um, and the other thing to note for people dealing with this disease is that it is their world as you know it. It's, it would behoove you to go along on whatever ride they're on. If they say waffles are floating in the air, fucking take a bite, pour out some syrup. Okay. If they say that, you know, Ronald Reagan was in their room earlier, ask him what he said to them. The more you try to fight the world that they are living in, the harder it's going to be for you to exist in it. And so, well, not very well said. Also, yeah, it's it, it's just what the revelations and epiphanies I had with dealing with him. You just go along with it, and and it's more important to reminisce than to ask. Do you remember? Mm. Questions are very hard for people mm -hmm. with dementia and any sort of disease like that. Obviously, their brain is having a hard time making connections, so you kind of let let them drive the ship, and it's just an easier, easier, smoother ride. So we were going through this conversation, and he was like, "Okay, now Nancy." I was like, "That that, that was your ex-wife. She's she's still in your life. She loves you." And he went, and I'm I'm high as fuck. I am like two blunts deep, and it's you know five p.m. and I'm just going through living this brutal existence. And he goes, "Okay, now who are you?" And I just, Ugh. I should have saw it coming. Kind of like a bitch who walks alone in a parking lot at night. Don't victim shame. <laughs> <laughs> Don't victim shame. You're getting canceled. Don't you victim shame hey, women who walk alone me. in the parking garages at night. <laughs> Please just watch the first episode. You'll understand why I have the rape card in my back pocket. <laughs> uh. You should have saw the rapist coming. You know, I should have, I didn't, I, I guess because I just was in the moment. And that's one of the most important, beautiful things you can be in life. But also in dealing with somebody who's going through this sort of disease, being in the moment is survival. And I was so in the moment, he took me off guard. He said, well, who are you? And I just took a hit of my joint. I was just like, that's a good fucking question. <laughs> I'd even, I'd even consider he forgot me. I just thought he was getting existential. And I was like, I don't. I'm everybody. I'm you. You're me. Who's anybody? You know, I I truthfully, I didn't equate it to him forgetting me. I equated it to me, and this is going to sound real, real woo-woo. I equated it to me needing to forget who I was because I was no longer her because this whole experience changed yeah. me to my core. And it was just an opportunity to get to know who this new person was within this life of losing the most important person I've ever known. And I just said, you know what? I'm your favorite daughter. What do you say? And you owe me five hundred dollars. <laughs> thousand dollars. <laughs> he just was like, oh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. I. That was nice. He said, I'm sorry. Yeah, you know. Because there's so much shame and dignity lost through this disease. Like we talked before, people talking over them because they just can't. They're they're crazy. And, and, and them losing control of their bodily functions and, and them losing relationships. And it's all loss. And you have to grieve the person while they're alive. That's the hardest fucking. You're not only plugging holes in a ship that's already sunk. You are. Having to say goodbye to a person you love every single day, you're losing them every day. You're having to learn how to grieve. Well, you know, I, I look at my sister Emily, who just, I was so amazed by her strength. She's got kids and a husband and is has her own life. And she was the fucking point guard for it all. And my mom, in tandem with my mom, my other sisters helped. But Emily really grabbed the reins and handled all the medical stuff, 
took care of the home care aid, just fucking bucked the fuck up and was able to get through it and help my dad maintain some dignity in the process so that we weren't just taking whatever we got. We were challenging the system a little bit so that we could get the best we could for him, mm-hmm. you know, and do you remember if he? this is something I want to know about people? I know they forget things mm-hmm. where they are. You know, do they forget who they are? Yeah. Do they? Is there I a think, point where your dad literally just is like doesn't remember anything? Yeah, they become they become very vegetative. They do. And it's there the, the moments of lucidity. Oh God, it's just like. I feel like lucidity is kind of like that girl trying to get in on a double dutch, just trying to find the opportune moment just to get in and play for a minute, and then she's gone. That's what those moments are like. You know, they pop in, and you're just like, (gasps) and you fucking grab onto it as a loved one, and you are like, ugh, and then it's, it's gone. You know, and those moments became few and far in between, but like I said, they were the most magical moments because I knew that about them. I took him, uh, one of the times I came home, I took him to a restaurant. And this is when he was in the memory care facility. This is three stops before his last stop. And as far as the facilities he was in. And, uh, you know, you talk about him losing himself. That for me was the hardest part because I'm like losing my guy and his personality and all of that changing so much. I brought him out to lunch and we walk in. He's got his walker and he's slow. He's taking everything in like it's new they become very childlike Mm. and everything's kind of new and he just looks a little out of sorts and taking it all in and then we get up to the hostess and and the hostess is pretty he's like oh and he kind of like perks up a little i'm like okay we still got it and then we walk and we sit down and the waitress comes over and she's a knockout you know she's like an older woman but just gorgeous and she goes so what do you you guys know what you're gonna have and my dad goes, I'll have you if it's on the no. menu. <laughs> He's like, I've swung this dick successfully a few times. Okay. <laughs> and she just looked at me. I'm like, that's my dad. <laughs> yes. He will have you. I don't care if it's on the menu or not, bitch. You are being had. It, it's. That's great. You know, those those things happen. They give you so much hope. If you're somebody who doesn't, you know, at that Point, we had already sort of deduced what was going on because he was in a memory care facility at that point. But leading up to that, those moments can be really tricky. They're, you know, it's like a fix. And you, you, you're you like, oh, he's going to be good. Mm-hmm. And I was an eternal optimist through him the entire time. I just tried to find the silver linings. That's how I've survived my entire life. It's probably the reason why I haven't become some crack whore because I am just eternally optimistic <laughs> there's a lot of positive fucking crack whores out i know there. I I, believe like, me i thought about it during quarantine i'm like there's a lot of positive crack whores out there they're not all you know pessimistic not i can wear an them. outfit no one will judge me they'll be like oh you're a crack whore fishnets make sense so like, ripped ones yeah especially. ripped ones at that um he uh yeah it just you know towards the end like him showing his personality became just fewer and fewer times and and those are the moments that I just you just sort of sit and you're quiet Mm -hmm. and that's a that's my other word of advice is just to be as quiet as you can communicate with them but let them really drive the ship I remember one time I picked him up and this is one of the only times where I was so irate him and I were in the car and we were singing Sinatra. It was just like a like half a mile drive from his memory care facility in Syracuse to the restaurant. And we were singing Sinatra at the top of our lungs. I think it was my way. No, you make me feel so young. Singing it and he knew the words. And then we pull up. We're meeting my sister and my brother-in-law. We pull up and we're sitting there and I go to get out of the car and he goes, man, I miss you. And I, I was like, what? He was like, I... I have missed you so much. I just, I want you to know I I love you so much. And I I don't know what's happening, but I just, I miss you. And we were having this moment. And just as he was about to say something else, my brother-in-law came up and like knocked on the window. And that moment Mm. was just 
shook out of the car. And I had to sit in the car for a minute. I had to like really like. I'm over here getting emotional. <sighs> they, they got him out and his walker was in the back. And I had to sort of like, all right, Steve, Steve didn't know what was going on. This is all new to all of us. And you had somewhat of a moment. You can't you can't try and grab onto what could have been. But those those things happen so infrequently that they become so profound in their scarcity. They become It's I've been thinking about that the whole time about how you know, we take a lot of things for granted in life, but just a conversation with someone, I'm, I, you know, then you're begging to hear anything they have to say. Begging for time. Especially if it's a, clair, a moment of clarity, you know, time, yeah. Time at the end is what most people want more of. Mm -hmm. Nothing else. Nope. Not Nothing. a better car. No. Or a better fucking couch. No. Nope. Not even food. Time. Time. Mm -hmm. And that's what changed for me was how who and where I spent my time with because every moment with him hit me so fucking hard that it like knocked it knocked my it knocked me senseless it changed me it changed how I stepped out into the world and how I presented myself and how I lived in a moment and you know after um after he passed away I've spent every holiday with my families. We're very with my family. We're very close. I'm a, I'm a huge homebody. I love being home with my family. When I was living in New York, I was home every weekend. So holidays are very important to me. And after my father died, everything changed because he wasn't going to be there. And so I decided to go do a USO tour and be away from my family and sort of recalibrate and and get used to that new normal. And when I was over there, I was reading something, and I forget who said it. Maybe somebody can send me a DM or I can look up afterwards. But the saying is, you never know the value of a moment until it becomes a memory. Mm. And that encapsulated everything for me during that process of losing my dad from him being, you know, lo trying to call somebody on his remote to him finally passing. And... Sharing is so important. Talking about it is so important. You know, sharing our experiences and everything is the most, I think that's service. You know, you doing this podcast is huge service because it opens people up to their trauma and lets them know that that they're not alone. And And I learned that in a really beautiful way, you know, by sharing everything on Instagram. John Heffron, mm -hmm. he reached out. Him and I had never met physically, but I, of course, know who he is as a comedian. Yeah. And he saw all the stuff I was sharing, and he went through a similar scenario, I believe, with his mother. I apologize if that's the wrong parent, but both of mine are dead, so. Um. <laughs> Which is going to be installment three. <laughs> installment three. We'll get to Nancy. No pants, Nance. Um, that's what my fans call called my mom. No pants, Nance. That's a whole story. We'll sh we'll save it for you. Um, that. John sent me a message and he said, you know, I'm going through something similar. I went through something similar. And I just want to let you know that hearing I've learned is one of the final senses to go. Mm. So people can still hear, even though they appear vegetative, maybe in a coma, maybe they're not responsive, that the, the belief and what people have said is that hearing is the last to go. And, you know, up until that point, I had written on my mirror, call your dad. As a reminder to me, because I was oh so God, scared to do it. I'm that. sorry. <laughs> Literally making me cry over here with the call your dad. Shit, God, this is what I get for screaming. It's just the latex from my pussy. <laughs> oh, these are hybrid tears of joy and pain here. Uh, those are the tears. Oh, those are all the call tears. Your dad just got. I me. wrote it in, oh, in lipstick because I was so scared. I was so scared of what he wasn't going to say or what he wasn't going to remember or what he, what what wasn't going to be. I just was so fearful that I wrote it as a reminder on my mirror to just do it every day. And this was during a time when my dad, after I had sort of had the conversation of him being able to, you know, letting him go. I had flown back to L.A. because I still was hopeful that he was going to pull through. 
that's how delusional I was during this. Um, and I was very scared to call during that time because he couldn't talk. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what's the point? And then I was like, what's the point? Well, could someone hold it to, for him? Yeah, me? yeah. Get that Garth Brooks headset on him. Get that fucking <laughs> Chris Gaines <laughs> easy rider on your yeah. mouth. <laughs> Where's my Hardy's headset, God damn it. <laughs> My daughter's calling. One of them, I think I'll I got I'll take a two-piece. Is that you, <laughs> Chris? I want to fuck my hot must. <laughs> Where's my vodka soda? Um... You know, he told me that and it just, it struck a chord with me and I had a show that night and I still hadn't called my dad. It'd been a couple of days and I thought about what John had said. And so, you know, earlier that day I had had an extreme panic attack for some reason. I just felt like this visceral anxiety. I called my sister. I said, you got to get to dad. And she's like, it's fine. It's okay. I'm like, no, you need to get to him. You have to go and be with him. I just had this like tangible, visceral anxiety that came out of nowhere. I had a complete panic attack in the grocery store. I thought the world was ending. I thought I was dying. And I told my sister she needed to get with my dad. And I went home, sort of calmed down, read John's message again, and just kind of thought about it. And I was like, I, I'm too, I was too scared. And then I went and did my show and I'd come home late, you know, it was like midnight or something and like waited about an hour or so. And I just, I, I, it's like a new relationship. Like I just want to talk to him. You know, I just wanted to like talk to him. And, and so around two, I finally got the balls to call his, his, his nursing home. And I called and this woman, Karen answered and I said, is my dad still with us? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, this is Jesse, his daughter, his favorite one. Can you, can you just tell him I called and that I love him and I'm thinking about him? And she said, I'll go right in right after I hang up with you and I'll go tell him. And she did that. I fell asleep. And my sister called me 20 minutes later. He had passed away mm. right after she said that to him. And, and I say that because John Heffron gave me such a gift and I say that because by sharing what your trauma is, you give other people gifts that they didn't even realize they had. Yeah. I didn't even realize that I had that had it not been for John Heffron saying, hey, he can still hear. You know, even though I told him he could go, he probably still was hanging on yeah. and fighting and fighting and fighting. And we have to show up for the people we love in in the hour of their need and in release them as much as possible. And mm -hmm. I wasn't able to be there for either of my parents passing away, which is so hard. But if your love is strong, you don't need a physical presence because love permeates That's right. this stuff. Love permeates stuff. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not in things, it's in people. And so as long as I felt that, I felt peace in being able to say goodbye through somebody else, you know, through the voice of another woman, but he knew it was me. That's right. And I have no rock unturned. None. Most people don't have that no, luxury. They don't. I mean, you, you're, you're fortunate with that. I'm so that. fortunate because I'd be such a filthy whore if it weren't. The other way. Yeah, you would. You'd be so, you'd be, you'd just be out there past, fuck that latex in your pussy. You'd be. <laughs> I tell people all the time, talk about their therapist and lithium. I'm like, love, not lithium. Oh my God, lithium. You just need love. You just need to be loved. Yes. You don't need lithium. No. You don't need all these things. You just need some motherfucking love. You need love and you need to release. Oh God. Well, listen, I, uh, you got me over here a mess. I'm over there like, my dad's dead. You're like, call your dad. First thing I'm thinking is Stella writing that. And then I'm thinking about mom. I'm like, oh, you got me, girl. You got me. This was fantastic. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you I know for making gonna time. I know going to help a lot of people. I hope so. And it will. If anybody needs information, especially if you're in a place where it's getting expensive or you think you might be embarking on a home care, check out We Are 
Hilarity for Charity. That's Seth Rogen and Laura Rogan's foundation. Mm -hmm. We are HFC. They do amazing work. They give grants for family to help them support the cost and carry the cost of taking care of your loved ones. Alzheimer's Association has a lot of resources. There's a lot of independent chapters in each of your cities. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of books and things out there, but experience is probably the greatest teacher when it comes to this sort of disease because it's not a textbook scenario. In you know, if anybody wants to DM me, I would be happy to help That's you if nice I have time thing. to just let you know, share with you what's worked for me. But like I said, let it be there life let it be their existence as they know it music is your best friend marijuana is great um patience in in forgiving yourself and make sure that you don't you know tr you try to realize that what's going on isn't them don't take it personally it's the disease they might get irate and say things and try and hit on you or, right. you know, I mean, my, my dad hit on my sister and I was like, what the fuck? He never lost it the whole way. Huh? I'm the hot one. <laughs> That's how you knew he wasn't Rude. well. <laughs> my dad's sick. We got to shut it down. He just tried to hit on Karen. And I'm not, I have a. <laughs> have I'm you gonna... seen these quarantines? <laughs> I'm going to push up Ron Rouge. <laughs> Get it. Stick him in the fucking, the cheapest home you got. <laughs> Tip him out of that wheelchair, god damn it. Um, please, again, plug everything you'd like. Um, Sharp Tongue Podcast. Check it out. Weeds Day, almost every Wednesday, we get a little stoned and we raise awareness and, and charity for Alzheimer's. Also, my YouTube page. Check out Mudwater. The code is Jesse May Mud for a discount on your on your mud and have faith and lead with an open heart. I love you. I love you too. This was awesome. It really was. Please come back and let's have another sesh. I feel like I owe you three hundred fifty dollars for this oh, no, hour. You're good, girl. You're good. Just have another course pure with me, organic, but chill about it. Uh, Ryan Sickler on all social media. RyanSickler.com. Thank you all so much. Uh, we'll talk to you all next week.